In 1905, several years before Henry Ford's Model T ever hit the road, a Swiss engineer named Alfred Buki discovered how to turn waste into raw power, but it would be many decades before the trucking industry fully took advantage of what he had discovered. Alfred Buki didn't set out to revolutionize trucking. He was obsessed with something far more fundamental, waste. Specifically, the massive amounts of energy that internal combustion engines were throwing away through their exhaust pipes. While other engineers focused on bigger displacement or higher compression ratios, Buke saw opportunity in what everyone else considered garbage. Born in Fintertour, Switzerland in 1879, Buke grew up in a country that prized precision engineering above almost everything else. His father worked in the textile machinery business, where efficiency wasn't just preferred, it was survival. Swiss manufacturers couldn't compete on raw materials or cheap labor, so they had to be smarter, more precise, more efficient than everyone else. This mentality shaped young Alfred's entire approach to engineering. After completing mechanical engineering studies at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology around the turn of the century, Buki joined Sulzer Brothers, an engine manufacturer whose products powered ships, locomotives, and industrial machinery. But it was their work on large stationary engines that captured his attention. These massive power plants used in factories and power stations were impressive in their raw output, but appalling in their efficiency. Buke calculated that roughly two-thirds of the energy in their fuel was being wasted as heat through the exhaust and cooling systems. The solution came to him while watching steam locomotives. Steam engines had been using exhaust-driven devices for decades. The blast pipe that created draft for the firebox was essentially using waste exhaust energy to improve combustion. But internal combustion engines were different. Their exhaust contained not just heat, but kinetic energy from high-pressure gases rushing out of the cylinders. What if that rushing exhaust could spin a turbine? And what if that turbine could drive a compressor that forced more air into the engine? More air meant more fuel could be burned, which meant more power from the same displacement. It was elegant in its simplicity and revolutionary in its implications. On November 16, 1905, Buki filed German patent 204630 for what he called an exhaust turbo compressor. The patent drawings show a device that would be instantly recognizable to any modern diesel mechanic. A turbine wheel driven by exhaust gases, connected by a shaft to a compressor wheel that pressurized intake air. He had patented what is widely recognized as the first practical exhaust gas turbocharger system. The engineering community's response was swift and brutal. Buki's colleagues at Sulzer thought he was chasing fantasies. The whole concept was too complex, too fragile, too impractical for real-world use. Even worse, early prototypes seemed to prove the skeptics right. The first turbochargers were troublesome and impractical for widespread use at the time. For years, Buki's idea remained more of a specialized experiment than everyday hardware, but Buki refused to give up. He understood that the fundamental physics were sound. The problem was execution, not concept. Working with a small team at Sulzer, he began the painstaking process of solving each technical challenge one by one. The turbine wheels needed better materials that could withstand very high exhaust temperatures well above 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Bearings seized from inadequate lubrication. The compressor wheels couldn't maintain consistent pressure ratios. The bearings required precision manufacturing and specialized lubrication systems. The compressor housing had to be designed to maintain consistent airflow across varying engine speeds. Each improvement brought new challenges. Better materials were expensive and difficult to machine. Precision bearings required manufacturing tolerances that pushed the limits of early 20th century production capabilities. The lubrication systems needed to function reliably in the harsh environment of an engine compartment where temperatures, vibration, and contamination were constant threats. A key breakthrough came in and around World War I when high altitude aircraft engines needed more power in thin air and turbochargers began to attract serious experimental interest. By around 1917, experimental turbocharged aircraft engines were being tested, and the first clearly successful aviation turbochargers appeared in the years just after the war. Experimental high-altitude engines showed that turbocharging 
could preserve close to sea level power at altitudes where conventional engines gasped for air. Aviation engines ran at relatively steady speeds and loads at high altitude, conditions that were better suited to early turbocharger designs. Aircraft use revealed both the promise and the constraints of turbocharging under real world conditions. What worked at 15,000 feet might not work as well at sea level under different conditions. But aviation applications, while proving the concept, were still specialized uses. The real test would come in marine engines, where reliability mattered more than cutting edge performance. Ships couldn't afford to have their engines fail hundreds of miles from port, and marine engineers were notoriously conservative about new technology. In the 1910s, diesel engines proved they could reliably drive ocean going ships. By the late 20s, engineers were successfully adding turbochargers to marine diesels, boosting power without a big increase in fuel consumption. The first turbocharged marine diesels, the 10 cylinder Vulcan MAN engine, went into service in ships like Preussen and Hansestadt Danzig. The results were immediately impressive. The turbocharged engines produced 40% more power than their naturally aspirated equivalents while consuming roughly the same amount of fuel. More importantly, they ran reliably voyage after voyage, proving that turbocharging wasn't just a laboratory curiosity, but practical technology. The marine application revealed advantages that hadn't been apparent in aviation use. Ships operated their engines at steady loads for extended periods, which was ideal for early turbocharger technology. The constant cooling provided by seawater helped manage the heat generated by the turbocharger. Most importantly, ships had dedicated engine rooms with trained engineers who could monitor and maintain the more complex turbocharged systems. By the late 1920s and 30s, more shipbuilders were specifying turbocharged diesels on new vessels, especially where higher efficiency and power density justified the added cost. Shipping companies discovered that turbocharged engines not only provided more power, but also improved fuel efficiency on long voyages where every gallon saved translated directly to increased profits. Yet land-based vehicles remained stubbornly naturally aspirated. The reasons were practical and economic. Early turbochargers were expensive, complex, and required skilled maintenance. They worked well in marine applications because ships had dedicated engine rooms with trained engineers. But trucks operated in harsh conditions with minimal maintenance, often hundreds of miles from qualified service. The turbochargers of the 20s and 30s also responded slowly to changing load, a behavior that would have been a problem in stop-and-go truck service. Marine engines ran at steady speeds for hours at a time, but truck engines needed to accelerate, decelerate, and change loads constantly. There was also the question of durability. Marine turbochargers operated in relatively clean environments with high-quality fuel and regular maintenance. Truck engines dealt with dust, dirt, temperature extremes, and fuel of questionable quality. The sophisticated bearing systems and tight tolerances that worked fine on ships became a liability on the road. The cost factor was equally important. A marine turbocharger might cost several thousand dollars, but it was installed on an engine worth tens of thousands of dollars, powering a ship worth hundreds of thousands. The percentage cost increase was manageable but adding a $1,000 turbocharger to a truck engine that cost $3,000 represented a significant price increase that most operators couldn't justify. But the biggest obstacle was simply that naturally aspirated engines were good enough. The trucks of the 30s and 40s weren't asked to haul the massive loads or maintain the highway speeds that would become common later. A naturally aspirated diesel in the 100 to 150 horsepower range could handle many pre-war trucking applications adequately, and simplicity was more valuable than ultimate performance. World War II changed everything. The massive logistics requirements of global warfare pushed truck engines to their limits and beyond. Suddenly, every bit of power and efficiency mattered. Military vehicles needed to operate in extreme conditions while carrying maximum loads. The luxury of conservative engineering disappeared overnight. Wartime forced induction work, mostly with mechanically driven blowers, taught engineers how to build durable boosted engines, lessons that later fed into turbocharged designs. While manufacturers like Caterpillar studied the concept during the war, the first true production turbocharged crawler wouldn't arrive until 1954. 
Detroit Diesel's two-stroke engines for wartime landing craft relied on roots-type blowers to force air through the cylinders. That success with boosted air hardware helped normalize the idea of forced induction, setting the stage for later turbocharged versions. The military applications taught valuable lessons about forced induction durability and maintenance. Army mechanics in the field couldn't perform the delicate adjustments that marine engineers made in ship engine rooms. Military forced induction systems had to be robust, simple to service, and tolerant of abuse. These requirements drove innovations in bearing design, housing construction, and control systems that would later benefit civilian applications. The real transformation began in the 50s, driven by the explosive growth of interstate freight transportation. The Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956 authorized construction of the interstate highway system, creating thousands of miles of high-speed, limited-access roads. Suddenly, trucks were expected to maintain 60 miles per hour for hundreds of miles while pulling heavier loads than ever before. Naturally aspirated engines struggled with these new demands. A typical naturally aspirated heavy-duty diesel of the early 50s might produce around 0.5 horsepower per cubic inch of displacement. To get 300 horsepower, you needed roughly 600 cubic inches of engine, big, heavy, and expensive. Turbocharging offered a way to get more power from smaller, lighter engines. The interstate highway system also changed the economics of trucking. Higher speeds and longer distances made fuel efficiency more important than ever. A truck that could maintain highway speeds while using less fuel had a significant competitive advantage. Turbocharging promised both more power and better efficiency, making it attractive to cost-conscious operators. The first successful turbocharged truck engines began appearing in the late 50s and early 60s. These early applications proved that turbocharging could work in truck applications, but they also revealed significant challenges. The constant speed and load changes of highway driving were harder on turbochargers than the steady operation of marine engines. Manufacturers had to redesign bearing systems, improve lubrication, and develop new maintenance procedures. Early turbocharged truck engines had problems. Their turbochargers drew heavily on marine experience, but still weren't ideally matched to the constant speed and load changes of highway driving. Early turbo systems struggled with variable load response in highway service. Drivers felt this as severe turbo lag, hit the throttle and wait for the exhaust energy to catch up and spin the turbo. The engines were also sensitive to maintenance. Miss an oil change or use the wrong grade of oil and the turbocharger bearings would fail catastrophically. Detroit Diesel took a different approach with its Series 53 and Series 71 two-stroke engines. The Series 71, introduced in the late 30s, relied on a roots-type blower for scavenging, which also helped low-speed response. In some later variants, Detroit combined the mandatory blower with an exhaust-driven turbocharger for extra boost, greatly reducing the lag that plagued many other engines. The Detroit diesel approach worked brilliantly in applications like city buses and delivery trucks, where frequent stops and starts made turbo lag unacceptable. But the complexity of having both a roots blower and a turbocharger made the engines expensive and maintenance intensive. The roots blower was mechanically driven from the crankshaft, consuming power even when the turbocharger was providing adequate boost. Mack trucks found their own solution with the Maxidine engine series, introduced in 1966. The Maxidine used a carefully matched turbocharger and fueling strategy to deliver strong low end torque instead of chasing the highest possible peak horsepower. This reduced turbo lag and provided strong pulling power at the low RPMs where trucks did most of their work. The Maxidine's torque curve was so flat that Mack could often spec a five-speed transmission where other trucks commonly needed 10 or 13-speed gearboxes. The Maxidine represented a fundamental shift in turbocharger design philosophy. Instead of trying to maximize peak power, Mack optimized for the torque characteristics that truck drivers actually needed. The large turbocharger housing and carefully designed turbine wheel provided strong boost at low engine speeds, where trucks spent most of their operating time pulling heavy loads up grades. By the late 60s, turbocharging was becoming standard on heavy-duty truck engines. 
the technology had matured to the point where turbocharged engines were not only more powerful than naturally aspirated alternatives, but also more reliable. Improved metallurgy allowed turbine wheels to withstand higher temperatures. Better bearing designs and lubrication systems extended turbocharger life. Most importantly, manufacturers had learned to design engines specifically for turbocharging rather than simply bolting them onto naturally aspirated designs. The 70s brought new challenges that made turbocharging even more essential. The oil crises of 1973 and 1979 made fuel economy a critical concern for trucking companies. Environmental regulations began limiting emissions from diesel engines. Both challenges favored turbocharged engines, which could extract more work from each gallon of fuel while burning it more completely. Caterpillar's 3406, introduced in the early 70s, was offered in both naturally aspirated and turbocharged versions, and later turbo models added integral wastegates to control boost pressure more precisely. These wastegates prevented overboost at a high RPM while maintaining strong low end torque. The engine was also designed with turbocharging in mind from the beginning, with reinforced internals and improved cooling systems. The wastegate was a crucial innovation that solved one of turbocharging's persistent problems. On heavy duty truck diesels, early turbo setups often had crude or no boost limiting control, so integrating reliable wastegates was a crucial step forward. The wastegate provided a bypass valve that diverted exhaust gases around the turbine when boost pressure reached predetermined levels. This allowed the turbocharger to provide strong low-end boost while preventing dangerous overboost conditions. Cummins responded with its big cam series, which refined turbocharged diesels using redesigned camshafts, improved fuel timing, and updated turbo and manifold setups tailored to engine speed and load rather than exotic variable geometry hardware. By around 1980, turbocharged engines had become the norm for heavy-duty highway diesels, and naturally aspirated designs were increasingly confined to lighter or more specialized applications. But the real vindication of Buki's vision came with the introduction of electronic engine controls in the 80s and 90s. Computer-controlled fuel injection allowed precise matching of fuel delivery to turbocharger boost, eliminating the black smoke and poor fuel economy that had plagued early turbocharged engines. Electronic controls first brought precise fuel injection management and later generations coordinated fueling with waste gates and eventually variable geometry turbochargers to optimize performance across the operating range. Modern truck engines produce power levels that would have seemed impossible in Buki's era. A typical over-the-road truck engine today generates 400 to 500 horsepower from about 15 liters of displacement, roughly two-thirds of a horsepower per cubic inch, more than double the power density of the best naturally aspirated truck diesels of the 50s, and it's achieved while meeting stringent emission standards and delivering better fuel economy. Every one of these engines uses the fundamental principle that Alfred Buki patented in 1905, exhaust-driven turbocharging. The turbine wheels are made from exotic super alloys that didn't exist in Buki's time. The compressor wheels are precision machined to tolerances measured in thousandths of an inch. The bearing systems use synthetic oils and computer-controlled lubrication but the basic concept using waste exhaust energy to compress intake air remains exactly as Buki envisioned it more than a century ago. The irony is profound. Buki's name appears on virtually no modern turbochargers. The companies that manufacture them, Garrett, Hulsett, Borg Warner, are household names in the diesel world, but the man who invented the technology that makes their products possible is forgotten. His patents expired decades ago his innovations became public domain, and his contribution faded into the anonymous background of engineering history.